Bon dia, benvinguts, good morning, welcome everybody. Uh, let's start with the information session about the Marie Sklodowska Curie action, in particular individual fellowships. Um, this is the third edition uh, of this kind of event, and I'm really very happy to see because uh, there is uh, really an interest in this kind of uh, information events because the, the, the room is, is full. Even this year, uh, there was a waiting list uh, with people uh, who couldn't or who can not been able to attend because the, the, there was no mess, play, uh, more, much more places. Um, the objective of this uh, uh, event is basically to provide all of you with an overview of the main characteristics and future of the Marie Curie Sklodowska actions, individual fellowships, as well as to provide all of you with um, some suggestions and tips uh, to prepare, to allow you to prepare uh, an excellent and successful uh, proposal. To this end, we have three speakers. Uh, the first one, or the first uh, speaker, is Joseph Nivo. Ni Joseph Nivo. Uh, she is the EU project manager and the uh, funding advisor of the research service here in the Citadilla mm -hmm. campus. He will be uh, the person in charge of uh, providing you this overview about the main characteristics of the individual fellow, fellowships. Let me also to introduce the other people in the other campus who, because I think you are coming from different campus here uh, at UPF. Uh, they are placed at the end, okay. Monse Morillas, she is the person, the contact person in the campus Mar. Belen, she is at the campus of Poplano. If there is somebody else in, campus, in Poplano campus who is um, Paloma Benamen, she is, she is not here today, but you can contact in, in any case. And Maria Gil. She is a colleague of Joseph Nio here in Ciutadella. She is more specialized in, uh, in law and neuroscience. Okay. The second speaker is um, Georgios Gionoulis. He's professor of the Department of Humanities, working in the area of digital heritage and virtual reality. He has been and he is evaluator of individual fellowships. And she will uh, explain the process, how it's working, the evaluation, and she will uh, provide you very useful suggestions uh, and tips about how to prepare your proposals. And the third speaker is uh, Judith Chamorro Servent. Judith is over there. Okay. She is a um, beneficiary of a Marie Curie Collection Standard European Fellow at the Department of Information and Communications Technologies. Uh, his research focuses on the biomedical engineering in field to solve medical problems by the use of applied uh, mathematics. She will uh, speak about uh, her project and about her experience in preparing uh, the proposal. She got a very good mark, 99 and four points. So I'm sure that she will be able to explain you how she do it, how she did it. At the end, after the third speakers, uh, there will be a 20, 30 minutes uh, for your questions. Uh, the presentations will be available on the website and even um, the session is broadcasted. So this will be also available for you, you want to see again. And well, I'm finished here. And Let's start with the presentation, and you said Nivo would be the first one. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, Eva. Uh, good morning, everybody. Um, <laughs> Logistic problems. Uh, thanks for being here. 
uh, with us today, and also thank you to those that are following the, the session online. Um, Marie Curie Individual Fellowships are part of the Horizon 2020 Framework Program, which started in 2014 and which runs until next year, and are part of the what is called Excellent Science, which means uh, that you have to develop a good project that goes beyond the state of the art and that it um, has the potential to, to provide a big impact to the, to the community, not only to the research community, but also to the, to the society. Um, about the presentations, that don't, you don't need to take pictures or anything like that. We will also be sending them to you uh, today or tomorrow, maybe, or over this week. So the main objectives of uh, Marie Curie are to allow um, researchers of, at, at any stage of their career to, to uh, acquire complementary skills to their, to their research and also to uh, have a mobility in three different ways. Um, intersectoral, so it means that if you, are doing, if you are used to doing one kind of research, you may move to another one, to another uh, sector. International one, because you are required to move to another country. And finally, interdisciplinary, because you are supposed to, uh, to work with people from other disciplines in order to improve your, your skills and to, and to make your project um, stronger. It provides uh, excellent working conditions, as we will see later, especially for those that are in Spain, that uh, it provides like a, a postdoc wage, which you will never see again. And also, it provides opportunities for those living uh, out of, of Europe uh, to, to return, and for those who have been on, a, on leave or who have been away from the academia for a long time, they provide uh, good opportunities also to, to return to the academia. And finally, it's important to remember that uh, international, um, individual fellowships, in addition to your research project, you need to also uh, think about a career development plan. So in addition to provide the typical research project, you need to, to consider what training you will receive in the institution where you will go and with the supervisor that, that you will have. In these regards, the main requirement that, that you have to apply for this, um, for this call is that you need to be either a PhD uh, a postdoc or have uh, four years of full-time experience in research. Uh, full-time experience in research is considered up to the moment that, that you finish the master that allows you to enroll to a, to a PhD. And it has a bottom-up approach, so it means that any kind of project from any field, any idea you may have is eligible to, for, this kind of, uh, for this fellowship. So we have basically two kind of, um, of, of uh, Marie Curie grants. Uh, one of them, the most popular one, are those that you move from an European country to another European country, or to a non-European country to a uh, European country. Uh, in these regards, there are several, several, several kinds. The most popular one is the standard European fellowships, which is what applies to 80% of you, so that you are, uh, like, let's say you don't have any particular um, circumstance, you are doing your research, your, in your research career in, in academia, and you want to move to another country. If you were in, if it was the case that you have been uh, out of the academia for more than 1.5 years in the last, uh, for more, more than one year in the last uh, year and a half, then you would be eligible to apply for the career Star panel that uh, provides more opportunities for people like if you have been in a maternal leave or if you have been working in or not working at all or in, in, other, in other institutions that are not academic, academic. And also we have the reintegration panel for those people that are away from, from Europe, from the uh, EU, and that would like to return to, uh, to, Europe, to Europe. Depending on the kind of Marie Curie that you choose, you can, you can decide to prepare a project between 12 to 36 months. Typically, you would try to apply for a project that, that maximizes the time that you can be a postdoc because uh, they are quite, uh, quite it is quite challenging to get them, so you want to, to, to have a project as long as possible. And what is important is that you have to choose within one of those, so you cannot apply. If you fulfill several conditions, you have to decide uh, to which one of these you will apply. 
And then there is another kind of fellowship, uh, which is that you would move from, uh, from to a, a country that is not in Europe, spend there between one and two years, and then return to Europe. Uh, in this case, you need to be a national from an European uh, country. So this is an, an important requirement. And you also need to have in mind that the return phase is mandatory. So if you go to Harvard and then you're offered there a very good uh, contract, uh, I'm afraid that you will have to ask them to, to, to postpone it for one year. Because otherwise, you have to return all the money to the European Union because you are breaking the contract. So uh, this is something very important that uh, please keep in mind if, if you are applying to these uh, fellowships. Uh, any, whatever the kind of fellowship you choose, the, the project that you have to prepare is, is the same, templates are the same, and, and they all work more or less the same with the only difference of the, of the, the duration of the project. Then, uh, what, uh, we, were we were talking about this mobility rule. Um, this is the, as I said, this is the main requirement. Uh, where the country where you are going, uh, you should not have been living there for more than 12 months, so one year, in the last three years, or if you are doing the reintegration or career development plan, or the sorry, career restart panel, for three years in the last five years. It doesn't need to be in a uh, like a year, uh, like a year long. You can have like three months, three months, and three months, or four months, four months, four months. That would be 12 months, so you would not be eligible. Uh, however, uh, holidays or short research stages there do not count uh, for this uh, for these uh, months. And, well, I guess uh, I have already uh, told that. Everybody who has a PhD or four years of full-time experience can be a Marie Curie Fellow. It doesn't matter the, at the moment, it doesn't matter the uh, career stage that, that you are, so you will be competing with, with people from all ages. However, the important thing is that um, your CV is, and your project is what is considered. So even though you will be competing with maybe senior people, you need to worry if, if they have a much uh, stronger curriculum than, than yours. Because uh, what, is, what is important there is what your CV is, what your project is, and the impact that the project will have on your um, career development. So if you are just finishing your, your, um, your PhD, it's a good opportunity to, to apply. And actually, if you can see this, um, these graphs, the, the, the greatest success rate is for uh, applicants that ha are in between the just finishing the PhD up to nine years of, of postdoc. So I mean, you are in, if, if you're in this position, just go ahead and, and try to pl and, and, uh, and apply. Don't, don't worry about that. As you can see, if you are like more than 15 years, the, the success rate is quite low because the training component of the project, uh, if you have been in academia for 20, 25 years, uh, okay, you can still learn something, but uh, it's I mean, it's less relevant than, than if you're just, you just arrived. And as I was saying, and this is probably what attracts the most of the people, um, why Marie Curie are so um, successful and I mean, have so, so much people who want to apply to those? Well, because uh, if you are in Spain, you get like 4,600 4, euros uh, per month, uh, which um, you can look at any other postdoc opportunity and, and there is no other that matches this, this wage. You also get 600 euros per month for, um, 800 euros per month for, for research. So at the end, if you are two years, in, if you have a two years project, it, this amounts to 19,000, which is also quite a good, uh, a good amount. And also if you have uh, kids or you are married or you are in a particular family situation, you get a top up to your, to your weight. So it's, I mean, the weight is good and you, st and it, you still get a, a better one. And what is asked for you in addition to the research project, which we will talk a bit later, and also Judith and, and Georges will, uh, will make emphasis on that, is the training component, because you are all very good at, at your research topics. Uh, you are probably nobody else knows better than, than you what, what they are about. But sometimes what, uh, what projects fail is in the, in, the, in the training component, because sometimes it's not so obvious. So you need to consider that uh, you have to find a, a, a supervisor that matches your profile, that, ma that can help you in, the, in research, that can provide you new techniques, 
new instruments, new methodologies, uh, new theories, etc. But you also need to find a, a, a group, or if you come to UPF, like a, a, a department that is uh, powerful in uh, seminars that uh, will uh, provide you with training in how to write um, scientific articles, uh, that you can may take advantage of the services, <coughs> for instance, at UPF to learn about ethical issues, uh, the staff of the library on how to prepare a, a good CV or how to, to, to improve in your oral communications, etc. Um, it's also important that you, as a fellow, bring knowledge to, to your supervisor or to, to the institution where you're going. So there is a, a, a double exchange of, of knowledge. And in these regards, you, it's important that all this transfer is linked to your project. So if you're doing a project in uh, medieval history, um, if you are an expert in contemporary history, maybe you need to elaborate why you want to go with this, uh, with this supervisor that is not an expert in your topic. It may happen that it may be a good match, but it's not obvious uh, uh, initially, so you will have to elaborate on that. And also, um, it allows you to, to go to, to events, to organize your own events, which is an important part when you talk about the impact that your project will have. And then, another important aspect of, of Marie Curie's, if you've read the Guide for Applicants, uh, is the word secondments. Uh, this is a word that the European Union or the whatever, whoever wrote this Guide for Applicants just uh, invented, invented. And the meaning of that is that during your project, you're allowed to move to another institution for up to three or six months, depending on the length of your project, and spend there uh, some time learning from them, so with another supervisor over there. And this can be either in a single period, you can be there for three months and then come back here, or just say, I will spend one month in the first year and one month in the second year, for instance, and say what you will learn there, why this, this second man is meaningful to your project. So uh, if you've read the Guide for Applicants, you would have seen that they say it's, it's almost mandatory. I mean, it's not like this. Uh, we have a lot of projects that that have been uh, granted and which do not have secondments. So don't just put it there if it's not meaningful, but, but if it is, if you find a prop, uh, an, an interesting supervisor that can match what you do here, then it's, this is a good opportunity to also uh, learn other skills that maybe you don't have them here. You don't have them uh, here. And to make it easy for you, like the difference between a second man and a short visit, um, I will not go through everything of here, but uh, this is important because sometimes uh, we've seen evaluation reports where it says, okay, the, the second man is not really a second man, it's a short visit. Uh, the, the, small, the, the, the main difference is that second men have a clear impact in your project that if you would not go to that institution or you would not have that supervisor, your project would not have sense, you would not, uh, I mean, you could not continue with your research and that uh, you have planned it in advance, that you say, okay, in that month I will go to that place and I will do this because this is the moment to do this. And, 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 this, and with this supervisor is the only person or one of the few persons that can help me to do, to do this. The main requirement about uh, secondments is that they need to be in the European Union or in associate countries. So uh, they cannot be in the US, they cannot be in Australia or in, in America. And one of the things that Marie Curie is put a lot of emphasis in are uh, several cross-cutting uh, cross concepts, like the responsible research and innovation. This is part of your project. This needs to be, you need to be aware of ethical issues that your project will have, uh, of whether there is any uh, gender dimension that uh, you need to take into account. Um, in these regards, it's important to differentiate between uh, gender, uh, gender and, and, and sex. It's not the same. Sex is biological uh, characteristics, so a man or a woman are men or women because they have certain differences. Uh, however, what gender is, is like the social meaning that we give to these differences. And the typical example in these regards, in these topics are, um, there were uh, uh, projects that were evaluating safe issues in, in safety belts in cars. They would never consider uh, pregnant women. So uh, what happened that when there was a crash, uh, pregnant women had more uh, injuries than, than men. So. This is something that for one project you need to take into account if it makes sense. If you are studying um, 
things that do not have, um, if you're doing a math, a math uh, uh, project, then maybe there is no gender dimension, but still write it in your application so that evaluators know that you've taken this into account and you just consider that there is no gender dimension in your project. Just write a, a, a short sentence so that they can do the check and say, okay, this person is aware of what, uh, of the gender issues in, in research. Uh, here you have a lot of uh, videos and, and documents that talk about uh, how to address gender issues in, in Marie Curie's and in research projects. Uh, they are quite interesting and, 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 and people that have been using them, they say that they are relevant for them and that have helped them a lot. So feel free to, to, to browse them and, and to take some ideas from there. And now moving to how to prepare the application. Uh, which is probably also something that uh, is important. Um, the first thing is that, okay, the deadline is 11 September, so we are almost in June. We have uh, three months and a half. There is August in between. 11th of September is national holiday in Catalonia. We will not be here. Uh, plan ahead, please. And also talk to your uh, project managers and, 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 and plan in internal deadlines to how to submit it in advance, etc. Because even if it may look stupid, every year we have excellent projects that don't make the deadline and that are just not submitted. And, and this is always for ta of time for you. And it is also a waste of time for us because we are devoting resources to, to projects that are not uh, finally submitted. So if you are willing to submit the project at UPF, talk to your um, project manager, depending on the, of the campus. And, and as I said, yeah, please plan ahead and, and make sure that you, fu you, fulfill all the, all, that you meet all the deadlines that you have being given. Uh, the application is, I would say, uh, quite simple to, to prepare. You have to, to prepare 10 pages of your research, pro of your research project in these three, um, in these three uh, chapters that you have. And then there is another part where you, you put your CV, you explain about how good your institution it is, and if there are ethical issues, you address them. Uh, about the ethical issues, uh, it may be worth noting that the 17th and 18th of June we are organizing a, a, a session with people from the European Commission coming here and it will be in the main campus and if you look at our website you can register there and it's actually, I mean, you're actually welcome to, to do it because you will receive information from, from people that are actually dealing with, with these issues. And moving to the, to the, research, um, to the research part, um, as you have seen from the previous slide, there, is, uh, there are three, uh, three chapters. The excellence one, which is the first one that you see, counts for 50% of, of the project. Uh, does this mean that you have to put all your effort here? No. Uh, because uh, as, you, as we will see in, the last, in one of the last slides, this is a very competitive uh, grant. So if you name for the best in, in each and every one of the of the chapters, uh, you will not make it. So uh, 50, 30, 20%, it doesn't matter. You have to get a full score in, in, the, three, in the three parts. In excellence is where you speak about what are your project uh, objectives, about your methodology, how you will address the issues, um, why is it relevant that this project is funded, why your supervisor is the, the, good, the, 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 the best one for you, uh, for this, Please get in touch with your supervisor, of course, and also you can address your uh, research managers that can provide you some information as well about the departments, where you explain uh, the training that you will do. So you have to talk about your career development plan over the project. And this needs to be really in, in detail. You cannot say, I will teach, I will attend courses, I will uh, speak with my supervisor every two weeks. You have to say, I will teach in this course which is a, I know, a master's or a PhD course, etc. I will uh, attend uh, this course in, um, I don't know, grantsmanship. I will speak with this person in the library who will tell me how to prepare a CV that will give me more opportunities to, research, to receive other grants, etc. So we need to, you need to provide a lot of detail. Because otherwise, evaluators know that or, or feel that you have just put something standard and that, and that you don't really know what, how your institution works. And also, uh, one of the points that it's quite hard to, uh, for you, it's like the last one, 
And we've highlighted these three words in, in red because it's where you have to say, okay, uh, how, I mean, you have to show that you are able to, to develop the project that you, have, that you are committing to do. And here, what you have to say is, okay, I've, over my research career, I have done this, I have submitted these papers, I have done this. Uh, it's like a little bit speaking about your CV, showing that, that you have the skills that will let you develop this project. Because as you can see, it's like during the fellowship. And this is the difference between the first topic, the first chapter of this second section, where you have to explain why having this project is important for you in the future. So you will say, okay, if I take this project, I will have received training in these research topics, in these sk uh, soft skills. I will have learned my network of, of contacts will be uh, much larger, so I will have the, the opportunities to organize conferences with other people, to, to prepare projects with other people that I do not know, I do not know now, uh, etc. So it looks quite similar as the previous one, but make this difference. Like the first one is during the project, and the other one is after the project. So you have to think about the, about the future. And also here, you need to be specific. When you say, okay, this will al uh, allow me to take a position of, uh, I don't know, associate professor, or this will allow me to, uh, to apply to, to grants. Which grants? So are they Spanish grants, uh, Ramon y Cajal, Juan de la Cierva, are they the ERC, etc. B. Uh, the more precise you are, the better, because uh, small, like if, if small, like very little points make the difference between the, 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 the excellent ones that, that, are, uh, that are funded and the excellent ones that are just there but that they are not funded. So the, the more precise you are, the, the better. And then the other aspects that you need to talk here are impact, is the impact of your project, which this sometimes is a bit difficult for you because you are very good at, at saying, okay, my project is very good. It's, I mean, we need to do this, but why we need to do this? So, and how will you show that, that this is important? So will you write articles in what topics and in what journals? So it's not only saying I will write an article, but okay, I will aim at this Q1 um, journal in my, in, my, in my topic. You need to be, like, again, very, very precise. And you need to take into account the difference between 2.2 and 2.3. What's the difference between dissemination of your, res of your research project and what's the difference between communication of, of your research project? Um, communication addresses uh, like normal people who may have no idea at all about what you're doing, who, to whom you cannot talk in really technical uh, aspects, maybe if you're doing molecular, um, uh, something about uh, reactors, etc. If you talk about the, what uh, potassium does to gold uh, and in terms, in what terms, people don't understand. So you are writing a, an article maybe in a journal, in a normal journal, or you're going to a, to a school and talk with, uh, with last grade people, uh, students, to let them know about what they can do in their life. Um, you, you upload a video in YouTube about explaining about what you do, etc. You don't look, you are not look, looking for feedback from them. You're just explaining and, and, and trying to, to, to make your project reach the society, who at the end of the day is who is paying for, for your project. And in the other side, dissemination, it's what you are more used to do, is like uh, going to conferences, uh, writing articles, organizing conferences, etc. And you also need to remember about the exploitation part of the project. So why, once you finish your project, what will happen with your results? Will every, anyone, anyone else be able to, to use them to, to progress in, another, in other stages? Will you be able to prepare, I don't know, an APP or to, to have a, a, a trademark, a, to a patent or something like this? So you need to think, if it applies, you need to think about, about what will happen with your project. And here is what I was, uh, what I was just, just saying. And also some resources to you to, for you to, to, to look and to put some nice words that, that the European Commission likes. And it's, also, it's always important to put communication, to put dissemination, to put exploitation. These words need to be there at some point because evaluators always look, always look for them. So this is all for you to, to read. And then the last part, which it only counts for 20%, and you always do it at the very last, at the very, I mean, it's what you always do at the very end, and you maybe only have one page or two pages. Okay, this is also important. Uh, it counts for, you, for, for your application as much as, as the other parts. Um, 
this is where you explain how you organize your work. Say, so in, in, I need two years of project because in the first six months I will do this, in the other six months I will do that. So you need to actually justify that, that the money that they are giving to you is, is needed for your project. And then you need to talk about uh, any risks that your project will have. All projects have risks, so if you don't find one, just give it another, another go. Because uh, a risk is, it may be that uh, you need a, a certain source and, and, and this is not available because it's in Philippines and you cannot go to Philippines because, uh, I don't know, you're not allowed to get into the country, whatever. So this is a risk and you have to say how will you uh, overcome this risk. And finally, you need to talk about the institution. If you're coming to UPF, then again, get in touch uh, with us because we will, we will help you and, and we'll give you some, some insights. Um, as I said, this part typically takes like from 1.5 to two pages, more or less. Impact would be also two pages and the first, uh, the first uh, chapter, it's between four or five pages, more or less. If you have your excellence in eight pages, then okay, you have to summarize it because otherwise uh, you'll get five points in excellence, but you'll get zero in, in other sites. So you will not get the project. And one thing that you are uh, requested to include in your application is, uh, is the Gantt chart. Um, there are many ways of doing a Gantt chart. You can do a very sophisticated one or you can do a very simple one like this one. Um, don't waste a lot of time on doing that because at the end, uh, evaluators, most of them, if they print the project, they print it in black and white. So if you have a lot of colors, uh, it doesn't matter. The, it, it, all, it all looks the same. And if it's like uh, very powerful, uh, very strong colors, like a very r a red uh, and um, green, it will it would all it would all look like like black. So it, it doesn't matter. And here we put some examples of of gun charts with different uh, different ideas. There we've chosen the, the simplest ones so that, that you see that these are all from uh, actually successful projects. So uh, this shows you that you don't need to, to spend two days working on, on the gun chart. Just do something simple that people can understand and, and, that, and that it's useful also for you to organize your, your plan. And then finally, uh, some tips on how to prepare your proposal. Um, the, the, the call opened uh, a couple of months ago. Uh, we said the deadline is 11 September. Then in February, you will have the results. Hopefully they will be successful. Then you will have two or three months to prepare the, the, the grant agreement with the institution. We will help you with that, don't worry. And then you can start your project from April or May next year, and you have one year to start a project. So you can consider that you will be able to start it from April, May till March or April 2021. As general tips, of course, read the guide for applicants. This is very important. Uh, talk to your project manager. You have to always try to make your project relevant to the European Union. So maybe at the start of the project, you can say, okay, this is what I'm gonna do and why is this important? Because in the, commission, in the European Commission, there was one session about uh, refugees and Juncker said, blah, 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 blah. And I'm talking about refugees. So my project is, is important because the president of the commission said that my project is important or try to find a way to, 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 make it, to make it relevant. A lot of tips, we'll not go up, um, about all of them. Um, I think the most important one is be clear in, in, in all parts. Do not repeat anything, even if some parts look repetitive, do not repeat anything because then you're losing space. And also, um, uh, be nice to evaluators. I would say so. Don't do uh, don't do st uh, strange things with format. Uh, just use a, a normal a normal font. Uh, use with bold. Use with italics. With uh, underline, but don't start doing like a lot of different uh, fonts, etc. Because uh, because as George I guess he will say, I mean their job is not to evaluate. They have their, their own job, and then they are asked to evaluate. So they do it in the subway when their kids are sleeping in the plane. And, and they want it to be easy and, and something uh, quick. And what I guess it's important to you, and this may be a little bit uh, of a disappointment, 
but Georges then will encourage you to, 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 to apply, uh, are the cutoff scores from the last five years. Uh, as you will see, you need to, to aim for 100% points. So you cannot, uh, so you have to, to do it a, a perfect one. Because uh, there is only one panel which is below 90, so um, all other, I mean, and it's 89, so uh, you, need to, you need to aim for perfection. So this means that you have to start working from your project, of, uh, you need to start working now, uh, talk to your supervisor, so get feedback from, from him or from her, <coughs> talk to your research office, get feedback from your project managers. If you have a friend who has already submitted a Marie Curie, it, no matter if it has been successful or not, ask for, feed from, for feedback from them as well, from people who are not in, in your field, because anything that, any feedback that you can receive, this is important, it's, it, it's important. And this year as well, the Spanish ministry has offered uh, a service of revision, which, is, which runs until the 6th of July, which allows you to, to send your application and they will provide you feedback. This, you need to do it through us, through the, your research office. So you will have to send us your research, your research proposal and we will be able to send it to the, to the evaluators. Um, we have been warned that proposals that are sent in the 6th of July may not be in time to, to, to be evaluated because they are expecting a huge number of proposals, so they have also limited time. There are three people reviewing them. So the sooner you send them to us, the sooner we will be able to give you feedback and also to send them to, the, to these external evaluators. And well, this is for the, the Global Fellowship, which is still harder to, to get, but Again, George will okay. encourage you to, to apply to that. <laughs> and how can we help you from, from UPF? Uh, most of you probably have already found a supervisor. If you have not, uh, let us know. Explain us your topic, explain us your interests, and we will try to find a supervisor that matches your, your research profile. Uh, we will guide you through the, through the process and give you advice. Uh, we have some material that we provide only to those that are applying from UPF, some, um, some, some templates with useful documents, some uh, fact sheets, some, uh, well, whatever, even we, we, revise, we revise your, your project, so just get in touch with us. And please uh, follow this deadline because uh, at the moment we have more than 50 people willing to apply. We have limited resources. We are five or six people only working on that. And we are not only working on that, we will have other, other, other projects as well. So please, uh, the most important thing is 10th of June, of, uh, 11th of September is national holiday. We will not be here, we will not be answering emails. So everything must be done by the 10th of September. Um, of course, if you do it in advance, much better because we will have time to, to go through it, to review, to find any potential last minute issue and to, to address it. And and, and of course, we are almost, we are always willing to, to, to help you and, and, and any of us will be like, willing to answer any question that you may have, which you can actually address to this, to this um, email address here, putting the subject, uh, MSK, uh, MSCA, and the department where you, will, that, where you are willing to, to, to address the, the question so that it helps us to, not to having to read all the, all the questions. And well, that's it from for my side. I think I, I made the time, and we'll have time for questions uh, later on. And now I pass the floor to to Georges. So, uh, thank you for being here. 
Uh, it's the fourth time uh, I think I'm doing this uh, presentation, the last years, and I'm very happy to do it because it seems it has, uh, with a lot of effort of the students and of the team here of the university, has brought results. Uh, Jose told me that last year, just in the humanities, uh, the UPF had uh, uh, four uh, uh, Marie Curie Fellowships, which is a very good score, uh, specifically for humanities. Uh, it used to be very difficult for the people coming out from uh, human sciences to set up good uh, proposals, uh, but now I think uh, uh, the younger students they are really improving their engineering skills because you need some engineering skills that are not included in the humanities background uh, in order to set up a proposal. Uh, in the overall, <coughs> the U UPF had eight uh, uh, successful proposals, which is also a very good score uh, for the size of the, the university and uh, for the competition uh, that is around Europe. So as uh, Suzette uh, said, uh, Marie Curie is a part of a wider set of programs uh, that are aiming to improve uh, and to develop the European research and pro promote researchers' mobility, training, and excellence. Please keep these three words. It's mobility, training, and excellence. Uh, and it also promotes, through the international part of the program, the mobility of the researchers, training, and European excellence worldwide. Uh, again, note these three words. Uh, and I, I'm just uh, insisting in that, because what you uh, really uh, have uh, to uh, do is not only to uh, have a great idea, uh, is that there is somebody who pays for this idea, and the one who pays for this idea has its own priorities. So you can have the greatest idea of the world. You can have uh, in your science, it, I'm coming from, uh, my background is uh, 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 management, uh, cultural heritage, and uh, digital technologies, uh, and environment, but uh, most of you are also from different uh, uh, sciences. Uh, you can have the best idea you can in your field, but if the one who pays for that is not uh, satisfied, you are not going to get it. He has his own priorities and he spends public, public money of the taxpayers. So he has to justify to the society why what you are proposing is important for those who pay. Uh, and those who pay are the European citizens, not the national states, not, not the member states. So you have to prove that your proposal has a European added value. Why don't you do that in your uh, country, uh, in the place you are? Uh, this is where mobility comes from. So my presentation will give you a general idea. I'm going to be shorter this time because uh, Joseph has covered uh, uh, most of the aspects. And uh, some tips uh, uh, of success uh, or uh, uh, trumps to avoid. Uh, I have participated in various uh, evaluation exercises uh, in Marie Curie and other projects and monitoring. And uh, 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 I'm trying to bring you this exercise from the point of view of somebody who takes a proposal. He doesn't know anything about that. He doesn't know the person who, who is proposing, because if he, he does, he has to exclude himself. So there's a conflict of interest if he has any relationship. Huh? So, uh, and he has to understand in 10 pages, uh, 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 and a short CV uh, uh, that what you propose uh, worths the effort and the money as uh, it is allocated. So uh, if you read at the, uh, uh, <coughs> at the guide, uh, the current guide that has changed a little bit uh, from the previous uh, exercises, uh, what is the expected output 
which is also the criteria of evaluation for the evaluator. The first, uh, at the researcher level, and the most important, is increased set of skills, both research-related and transferable ones, leading to, improve, to improved employability and career prospects, both in and outside academia. Increased in higher impact RI input, uh, more knowledge and ideas covered into products and services, greater contribution to the knowledge-based economy and society. Uh, that's uh, a copy-paste from the official uh, guide uh, of the um, uh, Commission. Uh, as you can see, the most important, the first one uh, of the evaluation criteria of the expected output is the set of skills that you are going to acquire and how this will be useful in the uh, research and development and uh, in the society. Uh, the second is at the organization level, enhanced cooperation and stronger networks, uh, better transfer of knowledge between sectors and disciplines, keep these words too, intersectorial, interdisciplinary, two words. Uh, uh, interdisciplinary is not only to use superficially some tools of another discipline, is to understand different methodologies, and you have to prove that. People who read it, uh, they belong to various domains. And uh, depending on where they are, they're experts to one thing or, at, or another. So if you just touch superficially something that you don't prove that you understand it, probably you will get a weakness and not a strong point. So you have really to understand what you write. Better transfer of knowledge between sector, uh, boosting a, uh, research and development capacity among participating organizations. Uh, you have also, as Joseph said before, you have to prove that what you're going to do will transfer knowledge and skills from one organization to the other. Huh? If you are going from, uh, I don't know, a, a, a university in uh, Germany to UPF, or the contrary, you have to prove that you are going to transfer knowledge from, the un from one to another. So you have to prove that there is something here that there isn't there, and there is something there that there is not here. Uh, that's how you prove it. And you have to explain how that missing thing you're going to provide and bring it to the organization that you're going, and what feedback you are going to, to, to provide to, your, uh, to the other organization. <coughs> then, uh, at system level, uh, increase in international, interdisciplinary, and intersectoral mobility of researchers in Europe. Strengthening of Europe's human capital base with more entrepreneurial and better trained researchers. Better communication of results to society increase in Europe's attractiveness as a leading destination for research, better quality research and innovation contributing to Europe's competitiveness and growth. Uh, please take all that into account when you are thinking of your proposal. You could think of a proposal that I'm going to study the manuscripts of, uh, I don't know, uh, of the 18th century in, uh, uh, in, uh, in a monastery in comparison with other monasteries, etc. But that is not enough. It could be very interesting for you. Uh, you have to persuade why this is interesting for the taxpayer to pay it. <laughs> it's, uh, it's a very important thing. In what part and why this is not paid at a national level or at a regional level and it has to be paid at a European level. Uh, what that offers uh, to our, uh, to Europe, uh, how this is linked to uh, somehow with uh, uh, the improvement of, uh, of competitiveness and growth, uh, is that it is not easy always for <coughs> humanities to prove that. Uh, in other science, it's more difficult. But there are many ideas uh, how you can prove it. Uh, there are things that are sectors that are linked, such as tourism, such as uh, that is attracted by uh, uh, cultural uh, assets, 
uh, such as uh, education, such as uh, uh, interdisciplinary impact. Uh, you are producing something in language that can be used, for example, in informatics, uh, uh, a thesaurus or something like that. That depends on, on your idea, but you have to address these issues. And uh, this is what uh, the evaluation of this year is including. The excellence is the quality of the selection, recruitment process for the researchers, transparency, composition, organi organization of selection committees, evaluation criteria, equal opportunities. Quality of the research options offered by the program in terms of science, interdisciplinarity, intersectoriality, and level of transnational mobility. Quality of career guidance and training, including supervision arrangements and training. Impact, that is the 30%. Uh, the 50% is the excellence. But this is what is considered excellence. It's not only the excellent idea. Uh, it is uh, uh, the impact uh, is enhancing the potential and future career prospects of the researchers. What Joseph said before, what you are planning to do what, with uh, that skills that we are going to acquire, uh, as concrete as possible. Uh, if you have something very concrete, it gives you a point. Uh, if you have a plan, it gives you a point. If you avoid to say anything, you do not uh, gain a point. You are just missing something that will uh, uh, miss you some precious points of evaluation at the end uh, uh, of the day. Aligning practices of participating organizations with the principles set by EU for human resources development in research and innovation. Read them. Uh, go in and read them. Uh, what the principles are for uh, human resources. That's the gender equality. There are many things that uh, Joseph uh, explained before. Quality of the proposed measures to exploit and disseminate the results and quality of the proposed measures to communicate the results to different target audiences. Here I will give you some tips. Uh, how you can exploit and disseminate your results. It's not only academia, it's the private sectors. There are the chambers, the professional chambers of each sector. For example, uh, the chamber of uh, medicine, the chamber of economists or of... Uh, uh, <coughs> uh, there, are, uh, there are also other stakeholders. You have to identify the stakeholders in the field. This is where the intersectorial is also uh, very important to identify the stakeholder in your field of science and somehow say that I'm going to provide them with my results and they will be interested in that for that and for that reason. And then the quality of the proposed measures to communicate the results of different target audiences. Uh, the commission wants uh, not only, you know that there are a lot of jokes uh, of uh, uh, many anti-European movements in Europe, uh, why the Commission pays for research. And they're saying, oh, they're paying for uh, uh, research in the size of the concumbers, for example, uh, uh, which is not true. You know that. All of us here, they know that this is not true. This is because this is the research. There are very specific things. Uh, but they want reasonably to explain to the European citizens why this is important for them, why your research is important for them. If you can use any possible media, especially social media, uh, and you prove that this is uh, something uh, that you know how to manage, eh? to multiply the impact through the social mini uh, media, um, use public presentations, use presentations in stakeholders' meetings, uh, in villages, in towns, in countries, uh, in the mass media, if it is possible, and you can get access uh, through radio, through depending on the kind of research you are doing, 
uh, I've seen in robotics presentations in mass media or, or uh, in local media in press, that's a very important thing uh, for uh, somebody to read that you are going to do and to prove that you, can, uh, you have identified clearly the media and the target audiences of the wider public where you are going to address. Include, if you can, participative uh, 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 a communication process. Somehow involve uh, as, much as, as much as you can stakeholders and the public to your research. That's a plus. Uh, try, it's a plus for somebody to read that I'm going, for example, to organize an open day where I will present uh, in, if you are doing a research in tourism, for example, I don't know, or a research in medicine, I will invite the, uh, the people that are having this disease, or I will invite the people, sorry, the people who are uh, uh, working in that sector, uh, or just an open day in, in, in a village, in a, in a city. Uh, where I'm going to go and organize something. I will create something participative through internet. Huh? You can do also that. If you have the skills, you can create a participative platform, uh, a page where people can participate in your research. Finally, quality and efficiency of the implementation, coherence, effectiveness, and appropriateness of the work plan, appointment conditions of researchers, competence of the participant to implement the program. I will insist in that, the last ones. Uh, the work plan has to be, first of all, has to be not too detailed, but not contradictive. To not have contradictions in your work plan. Uh, that's a weakness. Uh, if, you, if somebody identifies that you say, I will finish that in that date, and then uh, uh, you, you will start something that presupposes that you will have finished that, the previous one, and you put it earlier, he will note that. It has to be coherent, and it has to be realistic. Huh? That's the two important things. Not very detailed, but coherent and realistic. Uh, and flexible, that's the risk management. Flexible in cases that you face uh, any previsible, uh, change. And uh, the last, the competence of the participant to implement the program. They don't ask you to have a lot of uh, uh, titles or skills or they just want to see that the skills you have meet the requirements of the research you propose. Uh, that's the point. Uh, you, if you have a, a huge CV but you propose a research that, uh, a project, that this huge CV does not uh, uh, fit with uh, the project, <coughs> you'll have a problem. You can have a very small CV with few publications, very limited publications or actions, but it is exactly covering the needs of the project you are going to do. So they're not evaluating persons that, uh, reading the CV, they're just verifying that you can do the job uh, and you can do it well because you did some things in the past and you can document it. it. So uh, to make in a overall, besides the great research idea that I'm sure that each one of you has, uh, uh, the main issues are that is a training thing, it's not uh, uh, a research uh, by itself project. Uh, it's to improve your training, uh, to, to improve your skills and competencies. Is the European added value? It is a mobility. You have to prove why you are doing that in a European level. Is interdisciplinarity, multidisciplinarity, and intersectorial versus single discipline projects? And uh, finally, communication dissemination to academy and and society by all means. Uh, uh, participative approach of stakeholders or citizens in your project. 
So uh, the overall threshold is 70 out of 100, uh, but uh, uh, of course it is all about excellence and as you have seen before, uh, if you don't get more than 90 uh, uh, points, uh, you will not get your proposal. Uh, it's over 90, 92, 93 uh, that uh, you, has, you have to get. Uh, successful, successful proposals, my experience in ECOSOC, have they reached the zone of 4.5 to 5 to all criteria. Uh, if you fo follow less than uh, this in one criteria, you cannot manage it. Uh, the evaluators are called to evaluate each one of the things that I talked before, uh, following uh, a strengths a weaknesses scheme. Uh, they write down for each one of criteria and sub-criteria, uh, something very simple, strengths and weaknesses. What is the strong point and what is missing? The important thing is to avoid to have weaknesses. Each weakness that is marked, that's something missing, some contradiction, some whatever, costs you uh, some 0 0.1 or 0 0.2, that depends on the, uh, on the, on the proposal. Uh, and the, the agreement of the evaluators, of course. So uh, the people who are going to evaluate your proposal are multidisciplinary, are coming from various backgrounds and various professional origins. Some are not researchers, are only professionals in their sector, are experts in something. They have uh, different scientific sensitivities. Don't insult other sciences. Don't, <laughs> yes, <laughs> I've seen that. I mean, you know, don't take positions uh, like that. Uh, I, I don't mean the word is hard, but somebody can take something like pejorative for his own field. Huh? Try to avoid that. Um, uh, have, uh, they have an overall view, impression, and comparative approach. It is a, a game of details. Uh, and there is a negotiation process <laughs> which, is, which is limited uh, by personal strong views, complementarity, and finally compromise uh, among the evaluators. Uh, and there are also extreme cases and processes to deal with when there are strong disagreements and, uh, and uh, uh, um, uh, between them. Uh, the proposals in numbers uh, in 2018, uh, it was uh, 9,830. In 2017, uh, 800 less. In 2016, uh, a bit less. They're going up, they're growing. Probably they will, this year they will uh, go up of, uh, one, uh, of 10,000. Uh, however, uh, it is one of the most successful projects of Europe. And the budget is also increased uh, this year uh, in the next uh, programs for uh, the Marie Curie Fellowships and the ATN projects. Uh, and it is a good thing that in the level of Europe, we understand that uh, this is what creates our uh, common, uh, common excellence in, in all the fields and of economy. Uh, in 2018, it was 7,000 in uh, standard European fellowships, uh, 352 in career start model, 561 uh, in society in reintegration panel, and society and enterprise 173. That's the recent data. Uh, choose the right panel. Depends on your uh, idea and your uh, proposal to choose the right uh, uh, panel. Um, some statistics that could uh, uh, be a bit uh, disappointing for you, but uh, it's not exactly like that. Um, uh, sorry, I have to put my glasses. <coughs> uh, Here it is. Um, in just taking into an example, 
that 86% uh, uh, of the total uh, uh, has been in the, uh, the general fellowships and 40% of the total was in the global fellowship. The success rate was not more than 16% in this year. Approximately, it is probably a bit lower now uh, because there are more proposals and uh, less uh, 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 and less and more competition. Uh, however, don't desperate. The real statistics are different. Uh, a small number of proposals is rejected for administrative reasons. Another part, not insignificant, is below or around the threshold or just very bad out of competition. Uh, that, uh, uh, in my experience, is around the 30% of uh, each call. Uh, however, it can vary considerably depending on the year and the topic and the call but it's around 30%. The vast majority of the proposals are acceptable, good, above the threshold, but far from the fundamental zone. Uh, another 30% approach, approximately. The remaining 30 and, uh, to 35% are your real competitors. If you can do an excellent proposal, make the effort. If you are go just going to put uh, a trash, uh, to see the reaction for the next year, I suggest you not to do it uh, because uh, you, you mostly create a problem of reputation to your organizations and your uh, supervisors uh, than uh, uh, gives you any advantage. If you want to make the effort to make a good proposal uh, that probably will follow in the 30% uh, that are not in the fundable zone, sometimes it worths to do the effort. Uh, it worth to do the effort because even though next year you will have a good feedback and you can come back and improve your proposal. If you want really to invest time to do your proposal. But if you are having an excellent idea if you're having a very good proposal, your real competitors, your real chances, are out one out of three. It's not bad. It's rather good uh, chances to, to succeed. Uh, a proposal that uh, fulfills all the criteria, that addresses all the issues, that uh, have not important weaknesses, and it's on the upper scale, it has one out of three, let's say, to succeed. So uh, don't forget that we're talking about excellence and you compete with the excellence in Europe. Uh, so if you feel so, you have one about one of three, one of 2.5 chances to succeed. Some tips. Uh, uh, don't forget, Su success does not depend only on the excellence of the research proposals. Remember again that this is training. You have to be persuasive in the training field. Not only you need an adequate supervisor and the corresponding institution, but you have to prove it. Uh, it's not only to say that uh, UPF is a good institution, of course it is, but why it is good for your proposal and your research. I mean, write down, uh, this is what the university offers to me. These labs, these installations, this access, this uh, uh, specific know-how. You must prove that you know how to implement, you have a consistent implementation plan, and you're aware of the risks, and demonstrate it clearly. Don't be afraid to talk about the risks. Uh, but just have a, uh, because, uh, if uh, an evaluator reads something that is uncertain, uh, um, for example, I'm going to the last one, justify that you have access assured to what you need for your project. Uh, I've read a lot of proposals that they said, I'm going to study these manuscripts, these, uh, this site. Okay, 
Do you have access to that? Do you have uh, a permission for that? Do, do you have an agreement of the local uh, stakeholder, the archaeological services? The, uh, is that open? Uh, uh, you're doing something in, uh, in, in the rainforest, I don't know. Can you get there? <laughs> Just prove it. And, um, uh, and that what you get, uh, you are going to make it also as open as possible. I understand there are many things that are covered by copyrights, and the commissioners <laughs> understand that. Uh, the commission understands that. Or there are ethical limitations, specifically in when you are doing research on intangible heritage or uh, medical research, or, uh, uh, and it involves persons, uh, names, etc. cetera. Uh, if there are, explain them. It's not rejected. Huh? Just explain uh, what the limitations are, what we are going to make public, what are the ethical limitations, and how you are going to deal with that. You need to address all the topics, uh, uh, however boring they seem to you. <laughs> Impact, European added value, white public, scientific communi communi uh, dissemination, etc. If you don't address them, you will lose your time. It's a pity, but you will lose your time if you are having topics that you do not address, there will be weaknesses that will cut you points and you can have a very good proposal that will not get funded. Uh, don't forget that uh, that is always taxpayers' money and the Commission wants the taxpayers to know what they pay for. Uh, don't tire the evaluations, the evaluators. Make it easy for them to understand, to localize the necessary information and the corresponding sections Refer to it when it is presented already elsewhere to avoid repetition and save pages. Just a small tip. Sometimes one thing, you said it uh, for training, for example, uh, or for what you're going to do for dissemination, uh, in the first part of excellence, because it's part of your proposal, of the core of your proposal. If you want to, to win space, uh, don't repeat it again when you're going back to the session of the to your, you are going down to the session of the dissemination. But make, make a reference, a short reference, as I told in uh, the page one, I will uh, do that. I, I've read a lot of proposals, and uh, you know, sometimes the evaluators are reading rapidly or they are going to, they have to fight for that. Because I was saying, oh, the guy told that, uh, he talked about that, but it was before. Ah, and the other was saying, okay, why he, 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 he doesn't read it here? Uh, why it is not under this section? He, you know, uh, it's a, a very simple thing to make the life easier and to not make them that, uh, to feel that something is missing where it should be. <clears throat> and maximize in all criteria the strengths. No significant we weaknesses are allowed. There are allowed small weaknesses. Okay, he forgot something uh, that is, uh, I don't know, mine of minor importance. But for the successful proposal, if there is a significant weakness, uh, uh, it, is, it will not pass. Uh, it can reduce uh, considerably your uh, chances. So this is all I wanted to tell you. Uh, wish you good luck, encourage you to participate. Uh, I know that you uh, have, have excellent ideas, so, uh, uh, and you have the, the, uh, the capacity to do it, uh, so do it. And just to give you a last view, uh, that's how, for example, an evaluation uh, report is right in uh, uh, strengths, weaknesses, and score. Each evaluation is doing, evaluator is doing that uh, for uh, its evaluator for uh, his own, uh, from his own point of view, and then uh, they uh, compromise. Uh, so uh, keep in mind that this is uh, your evaluator uh, scheme, what he has to produce. Don't give him weaknesses. Give him only strengths. Uh, don't forget 
anything that could be, could cost you uh, the success for a small uh, 0 0.1 point of, uh, uh, of um, rating. Uh, so this is, uh, I think, all I had, and of course, uh, we're open for uh, any questions or uh, whatever you want to know more about. Thank you. We'll do the questions after uh, Judith uh, comes. Good morning. As they told you, I am a Marie Curie fellow, but they did not tell you that I applied before and I did not get. I was above the threshold, but I did not get. So somehow it's not to encourage you, but to encourage if you do apply again, okay? So going to the things, uh, let's say that the Marie Curie, um, it, as they say, they have a strength of doing lessons that they will evaluate. One thing that helped me a lot is this survivor's guide here. The survivors got uh, from Pesh, I think, uh, until from 20 to 37, it has a lot of key points and also kind of strange and weaknesses from other years. So it's very good to check if you have everything in the, every key point in, your, in the position that must be. The other thing, as George just said, do not repeat things. So you have only 10 pages for the part view one, that is not a lot. So what I would recommend you is to start with the section four and the section five, because you have five pages for your CV and you have one page for the organization. In the case of Global Fellowship, you have one page for both uh, uh, hosts. But at the same time, somehow, if you have five pages for your CV, you could take advantage of it on your section one, three, or on your section three, four, and the, th the same thing uh, I mean, you can take advantage of the other in, I say it differently, but uh, I mean, the section four, you take advantage in one, four, and two, one, and the section five, you take advantage in the one, three, and three, four, okay? So see them as he told you before. And the other thing, you need to make the evaluator remember your grant. I was not very good in, in acronyms, so these two web pages helped me a lot to find an acronym. And the other thing is, at the beginning, they have an abstract, so you need to take the, make him like or her like your project, so somehow try to make the best of your abstract. It's an abstract of your proposal, it's not about your project, so you need to summarize your project, of course, but also you need to outline that you know what the Marie Curie grants want to achieve. And for example, I put this project will be complemented in a leading multidisciplinary research group, and he say uh, it's multidisciplinary, interdisciplinary. They are looking for that. So the application brings these and these skills that will facilitate research in the group and the transfer of ideas. It's a two transfer way grant, so remember that when you write. And the proposed work will span this and this and this, enhancing the development of her career as an independent researcher. Uh, since Marie Curie wants you to, um, to achieve an independent uh, career or a maturity. So try to emphasize what, why, what you are winning with this Marie Curie. And the other thing is that uh, also for me almost an image means more than several words. So somehow, uh, for example, here in the career development plan, I put a kind of diagram where in the more than gray boxes, I put what I have been <coughs> done before, and in the light gray boxes, I put what I will do later. Why? Because I could take advantage of the section uh, four from B2, from the CV, so don't repeat this uh, dark gray, but just refer the CV, and then try to explain more what you want to, to achieve and be specific. So say, for example, I will, try to apply later on to this grant, this ARC or this Ramonica Hall, whatever, but put specific things. The other thing, uh, well, uh, they told you already you need to have that for, uh, 
for evaluation at 15 July. If you have, it's very good. At most, if you don't have at the beginning of August, it's really bad. Since what you have usually uh, the first time that you write a Marie Curie is a lot of pieces of puzzle, but later on you have to organize them. Okay, as they told, you don't have to repeat things, so somehow you need to organize. And one way to organize is mm, the UPS has a checking list, or otherwise you can also use these pages from the survivor's guide that helped me also a lot from 20 to 37. And then just try to check that you have everything in your, in your all the key points on all your sections, and in the, at this moment, when you are organizing it, try to outline also for the reviewer to quickly find. And as they told, if there is a, a thing that you are not considering, like for example, your project does not need gender equality, okay, but put, I have been looking for the gender equality, but I don't, in my project is not relevant, just because they will try to find in your proposal. So here about the pages is the question that we all do ourselves uh, from the survivor's guide, what they say, don't put less than four pages in the section excellence because it's 50%. This in, in the parentheses you have the pages that I use. It's not mandatory mathematical, you don't know. But the other thing is try to adjust more or less and try to find what is your point at the end. Uh, one thing I recommend you also is start to write with Arial 11. When you have finished your draft, for sure you will not have 10, you will have 10 and a half or something, change to Arial Narrow 11 and you will say, okay, I win something. So the other thing is uh, for the CV, try to put a summary at the beginning since they have a lot, so I am sure they will not read the five pages. So try to put a summary that summary is well <laughs> what you have done before that you can transfer here, okay? And the other thing about the section five, um, you have uh, here for the host institu institution in the case of the EF grants, for the global fellowships, you have to put both institutions. However, uh, try to put things that complement your part B134 and your part one, three, so your, your supervisor is also evaluated. So try to put the publications or the project that your supervisor is inside or that are related with the field that you are proposing. And the other thing, for sure, look at uh, the strengths and weaknesses from other years, from people that you have. I put some of mine here also, and try to identify the the, the core points that they will evaluate. He has put you, and it's better than here, because here is from, from the, the other year, while I think in excellent has changed yeah, a bit. Changed the, yeah. changed the lead so year, look yeah. from him better than here, okay? And then for the excellence part. From the excellence part, just say that you have to identify your key points for sure, for the one one, and for the one two, one thing that is really important, these are training um, proposals. So somehow you need to outline here, it's a two-way transfer, okay? So try to make a training that also help you to, for the section one four, but more for the section two one, that is one, what you want to achieve in your career development plan. So things that will help you to achieve your goals later. For the one three, as I say, take advantage of the part B2 of the section five. And for the one four, uh, I will say, what do you bring new and how this Marie Curie will help you to develop your career development plan, even if this you will outline better in two one, okay, as an impact. Uh, here I put some of the strengths. The ones that are on orange is more general, so when you are at home, you will have the material and you can check if you have this. And for other, as I said, I applied before, I did not get, so for example, some of the weaknesses for, mm -hmm. was that there is insufficient information regarding how the previously acquired knowledge and skills of the applicant will be transferred to the host. If you are doing this project, it's because you can 
bring something, so don't be modest or you will have this, this weakness, okay? The other things, uh, other weaknesses, is it was about, I did the state, the state of art, but maybe I did not achieve that they understand that the, the, somehow the, the bibliography that I was putting was really impacting. So if you have put a, a paper maybe that it's like from 2018 but has 300 citations, outline it. Like look, maybe there is not so much papers in this field but look this one that it's really impactful. And the other thing, it must be incremental. So you need to be a bit ambitious while ambitious does not mean that it's not achievable and it's not measurable, okay? And for the section two, for the impact, uh, what I will tell you is, okay, again, uh, look for the key points, of course, and for the two one, as is your career development plan and is what you want to do, try to link with the section one, two, where you put your training. And also, uh, here is the impact section, so you need to show that this is important for the European Union, as Gregorio said. So try to put something. One thing that you can do is just look to the I2020 program, look the objectives, and try to find the objective that is linked to your project. The dissemination and communication, they, they have told you quite a lot. Honestly, some part maybe where the scientists we write the less. But try to write a lot and try to make a lot of research about how writing. You need to be specific, so you need to put, as they told, you will do this and this publication in this journal or in this, uh, you will go to this conference because you want to achieve that. So be specific. And for the communication also, try to say who, how many people you will achieve, why, and how. No? And one thing to say about the communication is something that it's, for us, maybe difficult to write, but honestly, uh, when using the grant agreement, you say that you will do all of that. So put things that you are going to do. And also, one thing is that uh, you need to look, for example, a lot of videos. It's something that helped me from the European Commission. And for example, I try to emphasize three phases and three target audiences. So it's an example. You can do whatever. So what I said is it was a starting phase that will create expectation and on general promotion. So where I will start to talk with kids or general audience. And later, when I will start to have results, I will to talk with academic and, in, and industry. And finally, when I will finish, capitalize results. So one word that actually George say is use a multiplier. For example, a multiplier um, can be the European, com the European Community Communication Center, or it could be the TV, the journals, whatever you feel comfortable with. And the other thing is about the impact. For example, here I got a witness that say the analysis of possible opportunities to the researchers other than academic once is limited. Okay, as he told, you have uh, to say for academic and for industry. So even if your goal is doing for academic, outline something that you could do for industry in case of you need. And the other thing about the applications from before, say for one thing that I want to remark is for resubmissions. I was doing a resubmission and they told me the benefits to the candidate might be incremental rather than transformational. The researcher already has a position within the host group while I was inside of the mobility rule. So what I will tell you is if it is your case that you are reapplying or you are um, how um, kind of uh, applying with the host where you are now, kind of outline what you will learn from the moment that you will start the Marie Curie. For example, if a new machine is coming or a, or a researcher from outside is coming that uh, will bring something new to the institution, something. Otherwise, you can get this weakness. And, well, uh, always detail, so always specific, otherwise you will say further detail is required, is required to be fully convincing, okay? And for the implementation, for the implementation, just say, okay, they say no colors, I agree, no colors, but if you can do colors that somehow there is software, that what I did is with the software, try that these colors 
can be also seen in black and white, it, it helps to them because it, you have not so much space here, so kind of try to make whatever you find is easier to the reviewer, kind of link the word package, the millstones, the derivables, and the Gantt chart, okay? So later for the 3.2 also you have some key points here, and for the 3.3 three, I will recommend to put a table of risk and contingency plan, but uh, it's risk of your project, but it can be also about administration or financial or whatever, okay? And also, as he <coughs> said, you need that if you don't um, finish an objective, it does not kill all your projects. So, for example, I put that this is an ambitious project. However, it consists of self-contained but interlinked, interlinked modular objectives, and I put the picture there. So, meaning that if one objective I did not achieve, I can continue achieving other objectives. And for the 3-4, complement with uh, section 5 from B2, that where you have a page, and of course, outline key points because it's the last section, so keep them in mind that it's a good organization or whatever. I put, for example, that UPF has a, the International Campus Excellence Seal, European Charter for Researchers, or Human Resources Excellence in Research. It's the last paragraph, so keep their attention. And about this, I had all, all the strengths, but uh, again, you have three points and you will, I four key points, sorry, and you will be evaluated for these key points. So look at them. And from other years, I had, for example, these weaknesses that I was like uh, regarding to the milestones. So remember, milestones are as objective, uh, little objectives. So kind of try to make it uh, well and also in the Gantt chart. And for the other was the quality management is not sufficiently elaborated in the proposal. I did not put here nothing about the administrative risk or financial risk, while they are asking also you to put this there. And good luck, all the best, and hope you get. And <laughs> it's a good deal, even if it is a lot of consuming time. Okay, thank you. The last uh, point that you mentioned, uh, just to add, the quality management uh, is, uh, is an issue that has to be dealt, and it gives you a strength if uh, it is clear and you have uh, a good idea. You can even introduce kind of uh, external body evaluator uh, in the deliverables you have uh, besides your supervisor uh, that, uh, but if you are going really to do it, eh? uh, I mean, uh, it fits with your project, uh, to prove that you have a quality management in the process of your proposal, it gives some, some additional points. Uh, 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 can you hear now? Ah, oh, sorry, it was, yeah, I said that uh, the quality management can, gives you some, can give you some strengths. Uh, it's not uh, that uh, only are missing uh, things, but uh, if you introduce a good idea, for example, some bodies or external evaluators or besides your supervisor or professional bodies that are involved to see your research and provide feedback uh, in the stages or in the milestones, etc., that are ideas that can provide you with additional points uh, of strengths uh, for the evaluators to write down something that you are good to. Thank you. First of all, thank you very much for all your presentations. I think they were really useful. I have two questions. One is, where do you know if the UK would be global or European? Do you have any clue? Or should we try to avoid uh, applying with the UK until things are clear? <laughs> this is a tricky question I have. And the second one is, uh, Judith, you were mentioning that I'm thinking of 
groups that I have collaborated because I've been in, in European projects where they were partner and I was also a partner or um, a place I had done a year stay five years ago. So I don't know if you can give us some clues of how, if this is, should we try to find a place we have no contact with? Or you were saying that we can, but we have to be really clear about what's new in this exchange that we will have. Can you give us more? Yeah, Some ideas I was of telling how to more plan. if you are applying with your host institution at this moment, for example, that you are in UPF and you will reapply with them and you already have a position here, so try to say you will increment your, your knowledge. But uh, about your collaborations, for example, it's a good point that you put that you have these collaborations and you can bring new collaborations from them to the new host, for example, and this will make you a point plus, not a plus, I explain me, well, <laughs> yeah? So it's like uh, you put, uh, okay, I have these collaborators from before, and I can bring this new network uh, to, the, to the new host, for example. This is a point because you have this, the mobility, and they are winning some network from you. You are transferring network also. You see? But if you already, have this contact, I think you need some additionality, something new that you will bring in terms of knowledge. I don't know. For your project or for the union? Training, yeah, in all. Well, uh, you, you can always to have your all contacts, for, of course, it's always good, but uh, try to put something that they will bring more. And also, even if they don't bring maybe for you more things, they are bringing to the new host where you are going. You are transferring them your network. So it's a good point also. So don't avoid to put that. And about the UK, um, uh, the deadline for the Brexit, for Brexit is 31st October, and the, 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 arrangement, the arrangement that they have is that if you submit a project for an institution, so to in, for a British institution, before the 31st October or before Brexit uh, eventually um, happens, um, the British Research Council or whatever have has committed to to fund um, the project if it's uh, if it's elected. However, if you're planning on doing a second man, uh, this will be a risk of your project because if the UK is not uh, uh, anymore in the UE in the EU, and then you will not be able to go to the UK on a second man. So then this will be a management and a research uh, risk for your project. Thank you very much um, for the presentation. I have three questions. Um, so the first one is in, in talking about the impact, should we prioritize the impact within the EU or uh, you were talking about uploading a YouTube video, for example. I mean, obviously, that's potentially a global impact. Um, is, that, is that better because it's bigger, or should we prioritize kind of within the EU? And then my second question was, I know that, the, um, that we include research money. Should we be um, giving a budget uh, of how we would plan to spend that research money? Um, and my third one was, is it an advantage or not to already have some pre-results? Uh, so we, you were talking, you know, that this should be state of the art. But if it's something that you've already been working on a little bit and you have some pre-results, is that an advantage or, or not? Thanks. If it, yeah. I can answer the first and the third. The second, uh, it's up to you, yeah, and to you also. Uh, concerning the impact, uh, the impact uh, it's, has various sub-criteria. Uh, it's not uh, as uh, you saw in the presentations. Uh, there is the um, European excellence first, uh, which means that, of course, uh, if uh, you prove that you improve the European excellence worldwide and it has uh, an impact worldwide, it's a plus, but certainly, it has to have an impact concrete in something happening in Europe. That means that uh, you're going to create something in Europe that can have, if it, you can prove that it can have a worldwide uh, output, uh, that's a plus. 
but it will uh, start by improving the European research, the European uh, excellence in that field, uh, or the um, growth, or the um, innovation, or the economy, or the society, or the European citizens. Uh, and that's why, uh, as Joseph uh, told before, they ask if you move abroad even, uh, they ask you to come back uh, in order to uh, to make Europe to gain from what the, the European taxpayers pay, not the Americans. Uh, so the impact uh, should be uh, societally, economically, and uh, uh, in research uh, improvement speaking, uh, in Europe. And through Europe to have a worldwide impact, a worldwide excellence, it is very important too. Also in the dissemination, in the communication, if the world entire, for example, make a cultural project where is my field, and you produce something that can have a worldwide impact uh, in Europe, it is a plus, of course. And the last question was the, uh, sorry? Um, about having pre-results, if you already have some... Pre-results? Yeah. That depends on what you mean by pre-results. Uh, if you, if you, uh, depends on your objective. Uh, if your objective is a state of the art and an excellent idea, uh, you have to show how you're going from what the uh, actual state of the art is to the new uh, idea, to the innovation. If you can document uh, by that, that you have advanced already in the state of the <coughs> art, somehow outside of the Marie Curie Fellowship, and you have something that it proves it, it's a plus, of course, uh, that uh, you will put it in your CV probably, mm -hmm. and you will put it in, uh, in the first section uh, uh, where you document your excellence. about the budget. Uh, it is not mandatory to include a budget, and actually 90-something mm, percent of, present of successful proposals, uh, they, do not they do not include any. Um, however, it, in, the, in, section, in section three, the implementation, there is the financial and risk management, and financial and administrative uh, management. So, you need to be aware that you have 19,000 euros to spend over two years, so that, I don't know, if you need to buy a, 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 I don't know, a very expensive uh, machine or something like this, maybe uh, you would not be able to perform this project. So, um, whereas it is not necessary to, to, to detail everything, you should at least state that you know that with the, the funds that they are giving you, you can, uh, you can pay for everything that you will need in the, in the project. Also for your in, for your previous results, I would say if you can kind of show that this will interdisciplinary help, it's a plus. Yeah, because interdisciplinary is a plus in my degree. So if you can say that somehow, it's a plus. Uh, well, thank you very much for your presentations. It's super useful to hear so many tips. Um, I was wondering if there is like a place where we can uh, consult uh, the projects uh, regarding the fields. If there is like, I don't know, statistics on how many projects from humanities, for example, get funded. And is there or no? In the overall, you mean? Uh, yeah, you mean like uh, over like the whole? Yes, uh, like, well, I am from cinema, so many times it's like super difficult to compete uh, from someone of medicine, no? Because it's like very too different. But in some uh, grants, you get like there is like an statistic, and you get an idea of if there is is likely to fund a project on the arts, or if maybe it's not. Um, yeah, I mean, well, there are uh, two things here. First of all, is that um, you compete. So I mean, you submit your proposal in a, in a big pool. However, this big pool is divided into several panels. Yeah. So even though they, you actually mm, compete with somebody from life sciences, uh, you will be evaluated by people from your field or, or who are, has some knowledge about your field. And if, if I'm not mistaken, uh, what they do is uh, they decide, so they see how much 
what the percentage of applications that are submitted to each field, to each panel, and then they allocate the... So if there's a 10% of proposals in humanities, it means that 10% of the total applications that will be funded will be from humanities. Okay. Exactly. They, they, move, they put some budget uh, depending on the applications that uh, will be uh, submitted. Okay. And the second question is regarding the host in institution. Um, if there is like a interesting possibility that has like the interdisciplinary context that we are looking for, but is not like super world ranked, is it better to choose an institution that has a better ranking, but not the, the context, like the ideal context we're looking for? <coughs> Look, the idea of the Marie Curie is that uh, the institution you choose fits in the purposes of uh, your project. Uh, that's the basic thing. Uh, so, uh, of course, uh, a good institution is a plus, but uh, uh, the big plus is that what you're going to do can be done only there, or mainly there. Uh, if it is a smaller or more, let's say, uh, it will not be considered as far as it is not a dam. You know, it's not a, a, an institution that uh, is somehow, I've seen these kind of proposals, uh, institutions that were uh, almost strangely inexistent, but uh, it's not the case. <laughs> uh, I mean, uh, but you have to prove why this institution is the one that is good for your research, for you. Uh, thank you very much for the presentations. Uh, I have three specific questions. Um, how is the competition organized? Uh, is it uh, by research stay? I mean, PhDs compete with PhDs and zero to three years postdoc compete uh, between them, I mean, within them, or? Is uh, the whole pool competing to each other according to the, the panel? Uh, then the second question is, what is the weight of the individual CV? Uh, and the third one, in the case of um, application from PhDs, for instance, in the last year, how should we organize our work plan? I mean, should we mention that uh, in the work plan that we plan to finish the PhD, for instance, at a specific date, and then we will continue with, the, with this uh, funding, like, uh, um, for two more years, how is it uh, that a specification in, in that case? Thank you. Okay. Uh, look, uh, as we told before, actually uh, it doesn't matter so much uh, uh, what uh, level typically you have in the academic research than your real skills. So the, the, uh, what, and the skills and the competencies that you present to fit with the research that you are going to undertake. Uh, you cannot have even any PhD or never have it. I mean, the, the, in, the cons in the concept of the, of the commission, what's important in the call is that the skills you have, the publications, the professional experience, the work that you have, have done in academia, the, uh, your current situation of knowledge, uh, can support uh, uh, reliably the research that you propose. Uh, this is uh, the match between the researcher and the uh, And as it is a training program that uh, your CV at the end of the application, at the end of the project, sorry, it will be different. You will get some skills that you cannot uh, put in now. So for example, transdisciplinarity and uh, having new skills is also, you're coming from the humanities and you're learning, you're going to an informatics school uh, or you have courses of uh, learning uh, how metadata are used uh, because this is necessary for your research. So this is a skill to be acquired uh, within the project, although you don't have it, in the first year in order to apply your research, to apply it in your research in the second year. 
to give you an example of how it works, the CVs. If somebody says, I'm going to use metadata tools, and it looks at your CV, and you do not prove that you have n any knowledge of what metadata is, mm -hmm. you will be rejected. They, they will not look at your CV as uh, if you have a PhD or don't, but if you cover uh, what you need, and if what is missing is in your proposal to acquire uh, with a reliable way. I don't know if it is clear enough, the answer. And if, if I may, just in terms of the evaluation that you said, where there is different kind of um, stages or something, uh, all, all mental projects in, this, in one same um, panel are, evalu are evaluated uh, likewise. So if, but as George was saying, yeah. if you are a PhD student, or, or, um, or I mean, if your CV is in one level, you are competing with somebody who has a, a, like a better or more complete CV, but, but yeah, they're taking into, into account what, what he was saying. So um, there's, there's no difference between, it can be yeah. one, year, one year that everybody is in a, a PhD student, or it can be the next year that everybody is 25 years in their uh, uh, postdoc of 25 years. Yeah. You need to show that you will transfer what they don't have in the host somehow. Yeah. So maybe you don't have a big CV, but you have some point that it's necessary for this project, and it's what you need to show. Yeah, and focus in that on your CV, in that two things. What uh, to prove that it is sufficient to start the project, you will acquire the skills during the project that are missing, yeah. and at the end of the day, your CV will be different. <laughs> that's that's the, the whole idea. You will have a new skills, new competencies, and yeah, you like will... Yeah, the two-way transfer. <laughs> yeah, the two-way transfer. So I have two questions. One is regarding the second man, but maybe I will start with the first regarding resubmission. So if you have been abroad in a non-European country for five years and then you come back, the first 12 months you can choose to apply to the standard European or the reintegration, right? Uh, yes. Uh, so, well, it depends on how you, you've just arrived to... No, so last year I was in that situation. I applied to the standard European. Uh -huh. I get the seal of excellence topped 15%, but didn't get the funding. So this year I will need to apply to the reintegration because it's already more than 12 months that I have okay. been yeah. at UPF. So this is a resubmission, but do I need to state that it's a resubmission? Is it any good to put that I have the seal of excellence or should I refurnish the whole application to make it more appealing? Um, actually, it's not a, a resubmission because a resubmission is if you're applying the same project with the same supervision, supervisor and with the same, um, category. And the same category. Okay. So if, it's, if you were in, in, in European and now you're, coming, you're going to reintegration, first of all, you can prepare a three-year project, which it will be, make it already different. And so it's not a resubmission. And so should I state that I got a grant before with the seal of excellence that didn't get funding? Maybe or you can put it in your, in your CV. Okay. Uh, you can, um, this, this very same question was asked last week in the, in the, in the info day that the National Contact Point did in, in, in Catalonia. And, and they didn't have a, uh, like a, uh, an answer for that. They said, maybe you can put it in your CV. Um, they always say that not to put anything from previous evaluations in your, in, your, um, in your proposal. So not to say, this was considered a strength previously, or I've, this was a weakness, and I have, now I have done this to make it better. Okay. Just if you want to put this in the CV. So I will use the evaluation, but not a state that I have used the evaluation to make it better. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, no, because uh, the evaluators are not the same persons. OK. Uh, You're not going to be evaluated by the same persons that have evaluated you last year will be some, somebody else, most probably. Okay. Uh, it's by luck. And then regarding the second man, I was very surprised that you don't need a letter of approval from the supervision of the second man. So um, does it help at all? It's, it's very striking. If I'm in politics, I can say that my second man will be in the White House, and I don't need to state that I will be approved. So. Ah, well, you have to. Well, in the White House, you could, you wouldn't be able because it's in the U.S. But you yeah. could say in the yeah. But uh, 
they trust that you're not uh, that you're not lying and then at the end of the project you will be asked for a report so uh, if you don't if you've promised a second man or any activity and then you haven't done it whatever the reason it is you have to explain why and if it's considered uh, a super important task and you haven't done it you may receive a bad report and, and some but in the grant agreement, it will be there, right? Yeah, yeah. So the, what your proposal, how the way you submit it, is if it's approved, it goes as it is in the grant agreement. Okay. The proposals are, are also monitored. I mean, you. That's why they ask for. Uh, you have to submit your deliverables. You have to submit your uh, uh, what it is written, and there are monitors who are looking at them. And if you promise something that you don't do it. Of course, you are going to have problems. <laughs> it yeah. means they can stop your even uh, the commission can stop the funding at the middle if, if if they realize that in the first year you have not done or submitted what you should submit, or the second year they can just put a red card and stop it, or even ask back the funding at uh, the end of the day. Uh, so you cannot promise things that, of course, you can have small. That's why the risk management uh, exists. You can have small. Uh, uh, objectives or uh, failures or but uh, not important things if you say I'm going to, to do this segment in this museum and because this will give me these skills and you don't do it you have to explain why and what will you substitute it with if you don't have it in the risk management yeah, well, the, the Trump has not accepted me in the White House, for example. You know. Exactly. Thank you. <laughs> Which is not used. <laughs> it's very frequent now to change. <laughs> uh, thank you, too, for your presentations. They were very useful. Um, just following, and one of my questions follows on the secondments. If you have a global fellowship, can you have a secondment? Like if you're in Australia, can you have a secondment in another university in Australia? No. 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 It has to be in... Only the European. The European. You can do a secondment while, while you're in, in Australia, come to Europe and spend three months uh, in Paris. Ah, you can but come then, back here. Uh, so you, but it's still in the... In the Counting as for the time that you are in, in, Aust in Australia. In the, mm. uh, so if you want to go to another university, for example, in Australia, does it, does it make sense to, to state that, and that? But you have to pay from your own money, I guess? Or? Uh, that, I mean, the travel? Yeah, I travel, know, that, accommodation. I mean, if maybe you can say that you will do a short research stay. Uh, like, you will go there to do, I don't know, field work or to read, uh, to go to the library because they have a manuscript about the aborigines who nobody else has or something like that. But... Uh, that should be something which is not a, a core task of your of your project. So it's like because you know you know that somebody else is uh, is very good at the topic as well and may help you in one particular point, but like very specific and very like that. If you don't at the end of the day you cannot go there, it doesn't it doesn't put a problem in your project. Okay. And uh, and. Also talking about this, uh, imagine that you, you want to apply for a host institution, but in the research group is very good, but there's not a clear supervisor, key figure that has a you know strong profile. So, um, you know, is it better to pick another institution that has you know how clear, how important is the figure of the supervisors versus the research center? Because, for example, the one I'm thinking of has a strong research center, but there's not clear figure, you know, like clear supervisor that has a strong profile. I mean, can, can you make up for the reset center being very strong if the um, supervisor is not that strong? So that's a question. And also, if you're going for the global, the return institution, um, is it possible to say that there's no institution that really matches what you're doing here and therefore you bring in, in something different, no? Something you're adding to what already was there. Or do I have to go to Finland because in Finland there's that specific one? I mean, can you say something, you know, I want to come back to Spain or to Barcelona and I want to add something to a research group that doesn't have it right now. Does it, that make sense or it will be much better if I go to Finland, for example? I'm making it up, but, you know, do you follow my question? So, um, as, you know, when I return, is it better to go to the best research center than does that? Or can you justify going to another research center who is not currently doing that, what you're doing, 
but you can add your expertise. Uh, so there are two questions. One about the supervisor. Uh, it is uh, rather important to have a good supervisor, but you have, it's better to have a supervising process uh, that includes the know-how that you, you will uh, help you, will assist you to, to, to achieve your objectives. Uh, that means to prove that there is the know-how in the institution, there is a process to transfer it to you. Uh, if you can prove that, of course, uh, it's not only the CV of the supervisor, you can have that, two supervisors, you can have uh, a multidisciplinary, especially supervision team uh, in case you are doing something in culture and informatics, you can have two persons that are, uh, or a team that is supervising your research. So you can resolve that if really there is the know-how you need in the institution. Uh, this is what you have to prove. But the know-how is there and there is a method to transfer it to you. Uh, and the know-how, of course, are persons. Uh, it's not uh, in the air. It's <laughs> somebody who is going to transfer it to you somehow. Uh, and the second one, it was? It was returning, uh, when you return back, uh, that your returning institution, if it, uh, if the returning institution doesn't have the, the expertise you, you know, they're, they're not experts in what you're bringing them. So does it make sense to say, I'm not going back to the best institution that does this, but I'm bringing a new skill to this institution. Or should you yes. be? Absolutely. Yes, absolutely. Yes, you, you are bringing a new skill in this institution. Yes, of course. It's what they are looking it's for. They are looking, looking for, for mobility, so yeah. it's good exactly. that you bring something new. But you mentioned it's a two-way. It's a two-way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. It's. Uh, Yeah, but yeah. 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 So, I mean, related to this, um, regarding the, the, the mandatory year that we will do uh, uh, in Europe, how um, specific do we have to be? Like, uh, do, do I need to say that I want to come back to this institute? Or. Um, no, when, when you submit the application, you say, I already say, for instance, I will be. When you submit the application with UPF? And you say, I will go to Australia with uh, the Sydney University. But, but you submit the application already with the institution where you will return. Okay. And actually, while, while you are in the outgoing phase, so in Australia, your employment contract will be with UPF. Okay. So you will reach a deal or something with them, but you will be paid by UPF. Okay, okay thanks. One question. I, I'm not sure if I read in the, in the application. If we need support to process lots of data, is it possible to do like a small contract for, I don't know, a master student or so to provide assistance with that? Or it's supposed to be like a one-man, you know, do it all project? Yes, well, woman. You, you can have technical support, not research support. You're not a company, but you can spend part of your money uh, to to proceed your data or to whatever you need uh, for your research. Uh, that's uh, clear. Not to uh, necessarily to contract a person. You can contract an institution. You can pay an invoice that is necessary for proceeding the data or whatever. Because uh, you, you cannot pay a person. Uh, you, you, in order to pay a person, you have to be a uh, company, uh, <laughs> practically speaking. Uh, you must somehow pay an institution or, or buy some services that are necessary for your work. Hello. My question is, um, now that's from what I just heard, uh, is it a good idea to say that the budget for research could be used to enhance mobility by, for instance, bringing students from abroad to Spain so that that will help to the project and that will also help to the mobility and internationalization and so on? Do you think that's a good idea to 
to, to say that the way of making use of that uh, budget. Uh, I didn't, uh, can sorry, you can, you? Can, you yeah, can you repeat? You said, I mean, uh, the fellow from Marie Curie gets his own salary money, and then you get 600 euros per month for research. So my question is, is it a good idea to say that that money will be used to bring students from, let's say, Mexico down here? So that will help to the research project, and that will also contribute to enhancing mobility and internationalization and so on. I think they can help you technically, but not in research. No, exactly. Yeah. They, you can have technical assistance, but you cannot subcontract research. That, this is that's why it is individual. It's your research. So uh, there are other kind of projects like ITNs uh, that are among institutions that are doing exactly this. They are paying the institutions, the University uh, of Pompeo, the University of uh, Vienna, and the university, and they have a common network, and they contract uh, uh, researchers, and they are moving them around in, in a bigger project. Uh, but as a person, that's why they are called individual, you cannot subcontract uh, research. Uh, you can only uh, buy and pay technical uh, services uh, of any kind, uh, to a university, to a company, to printing, for communication, for somebody to make you a web page, this kind of, of stuff. Uh, thank you for the helpful presentation. Uh, I would like to ask uh, if you had already a Marie Curie before, like uh, if you were in a network for the PhD, it's something positive, like does it change any, I mean, do you have to highlight this or? I mean, yeah, because it's, you can put it in your CV. This is something a competitive, uh, like if you got another Marie Curie, it means that you got kind of a, jo a, comp a competitive job there were a lot of people applying to that, and you were the one that got it, so it means that you kind of yeah. were standing in that, in that uh, thing. And it also, it may be a, also a good point in, in one, in the 1.4, 1. 1. where you say, okay, um, I, am I have already been involved in a Marie Curie, so I know more or less how it works, and, and, and this is a plus because I know how to work in a project and in a team, etc. But uh, it, does, it doesn't make any, no. Big difference. no, it's not a plus. Uh, uh, and I would like to ask uh, if uh, the help that we can get from UPF, it's only if we apply for uh, doing uh, this to UPF, or if we now are at UPF and we want to go there, like apply for Marie Curie somewhere else, do uh, we have the help anyway or not? Well, at the moment, we can only support those that are willing to come to, oh, okay. to UPF, because, I mean, wherever you are going, willing to go, they will have uh, us, yeah, they will and, uh, yeah. and they will okay. help you as we do. Uh, then, um, like, uh, in research in general, it's always very important uh, to publish many papers and all these things. But uh, in, um, like, if you apply to this uh, Marie Curie proposal, now you have to take care of a lot of other things. So probably in the end, you will have uh, less, uh, I mean, unavoidably, less time for, uh, for research than if you were just doing research, no? So... I mean, if you give a lot of emphasis to, to outreach activity, for example, to this dissemination, I don't know, like, so my question is, for example, also, do you need it, like, it, it's in my opinion, like, having an amazing project, uh, great results, disseminate those results, not, like, being very strong in all these aspects, it's a bit tricky, you know, it's, like, difficult to happen all of these things together. What about if you maybe focus on disseminating uh, something more like already established and uh, so and yeah, not yeah. necessarily like having you as like i will find these amazing new results and then i will disseminate these results to european like to everybody i don't know yeah, balance, yeah. i don't know you if it's clear what i'm asking somehow. you have a, you need the balance of both uh, you have to balance it, depending also on the kind of your project a lot. I mean, it's a very different thing if you're doing uh, uh, medicine, for example, and biology, and something very specific, a different thing when you're doing uh, uh, 
history or uh, uh, archaeology. You have to balance and to prove that you're doing the best you can following your project uh, potential. Uh, there are projects that have higher potential and projects that have less potential by its nature, I mean, but to choose correctly the target groups and uh, also the publications that are uh, important in this precise field. It depends. It depends. It's, it's, it's really depending on the project, uh, how you make the balance. Yeah, but it's not uh, negative a priori, the fact of uh, giving uh, more stress to dissemination and, uh, and then being less, I don't know, like you risk then to have maybe less impactful publication. I I, I'm asking if this is, uh, is very risky or if it's a possibility to... I cannot tell you um, in general. It means it, it, it has to be integrated in, in the more or less. Yeah. I don't understand what or you mean. If you mean, I mean, you can also disseminate when it's published. If it is that a question, I mean, your question is if you do a lot of dissemination, maybe you will not can publish because something. But uh, uh, no? for example, let's suppose uh, you you think now it's very important uh, climate science, no? But maybe you're not already super expert in climate science, so maybe it's not so. The innovative part is not so much uh, the specific uh, results you will have. Uh, that maybe you, you okay, you also have a, a research project, but. Maybe in climate science, it's very important to, to be more efficient in the disseminating, let's suppose. So you will have, a, like, you will put particular effort in a dissemination of results unless on having innovative results itself in the research, is, like, for example. No, you have to put all the effort possible to disseminate in the maximum possible audiences, scientific and, uh, uh, and, uh, and uh, wide social audience media. and social media of any kind of results. But that, of course, the potential depends of the project you have. If you have a project of robotics, they are going to call you in all mass media and televisions. Uh, and the evaluator will expect to see that because it's something that very, it's very appealing. If you saw something, I don't know, just... Uh, uh, very limited, he's expecting to see uh, a dissemination in the respective audiences. Uh, if you're working in a village and the um, development of an area, for example, at least to see that you're going to disseminate in the mm -hmm. chambers of commerce, you're going to contact the professionals, you're going to organize some, some kind of public events. And, and in each case, you are going to publish some articles, uh, some papers in, for the academic dissemination in the, in the relevant uh, conferences or uh, re peer-reviewed uh, journals or whatever it fits in your project. But uh, dissemination is very important anyway. It is not comparative. I mean, they are not going to say that a project that is studying, the, the evaluator will not see that the project that is studying uh, the manuscripts of uh, the 14th century in Austria, they are not expecting to see that uh, in broadcasted in, in, in Europe. Uh, but they're expecting to see something that uh, fits with the potential of this project. must be linked to your objectives of the project. Yeah. Thank you very much. That was very useful. So I have more like um, technical questions regarding the publications. So if you have several manuscripts in preparation or they are submitted, but, you, but they are not uploaded in BioArchive, for example, is there a point to put this in a section in your CV, like manuscripts in preparation or submitted or something? Or is like they are nowhere, they don't exist yet, or something like that. I put, for example, in the CV, I put that I was preparing a manuscript that was under a, a patent, and then I put also 
that I I was as a co-author of a manuscript that was already submitted in in, re, in revision, not something that you have not done yet. So yeah. something that has a reason why you don't. Yeah. Why? For example, because there is an IP team that is looking, or you need to wait wait um, wait a bit, or whatever. Or it is in revision already in this journal, and yeah. then you put in this journal. Yeah. So. But if it's like in preparation, almost about to submit, it's pointless, right? Or I don't, think, I don't, know. <laughs> I, I don't <laughs> think so. That uh, it doesn't prove anything. Exactly. So if it is submitted somehow, but if you say I'm preparing ten ideas and you don't have anything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, then, okay. Uh, this yeah. this is part of your proposal somehow. Hmm. Uh, you can say in the proposal yeah. I'm, I'm I'm doing that. Yeah. Okay. Um, the, 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 we have a colleague who submitted a Marie Curie, and he was, he had one of these big weaknesses they identified was that the, he was a global fellowship and the return organization, uh, he, they told him that weakness was that he, this, this organization is a research center that doesn't have proper, um, um, teaching positions, like uh, research positions, it's just a research center. So uh, that the, they wouldn't, the, the research center could not support him in his uh, career path. That he said he was going to apply for a Ramon Cajal or an ERC, but uh, but uh, obviously that wasn't enough, and that was found like a strong weakness. So, um, but then we know that two other colleagues did get a Marie Curie in that same institution. So. Um, what does this, I mean, is that really depend on who in revises your Marie Curie? Obviously, that's like a lack. Obviously, we really know that. Also some lack. So that's the, so that's the that. thing. But then the yeah, advice is, should we apply with this reset center? Yeah. Or, is that, or is that risky? Because we're going to get this message uh, that, you know. In principle, this, it the, is not the, risky. In principle, it is not risky. That depends also how the evaluators have seen uh, the current uh, I, I'm not going to defend their position because I don't know the project, but uh, they could have seen that this research center specifically for this proposal was something oh, that was his for his career development yeah. of the precise project uh, was not adequate. Uh, not generally that the research center could not support uh, uh, they, they were quite career. specific, apparently. Yeah? They were quite specific about this, that uh, the problem was that he couldn't, uh, that the, you know, he could not be supported by the research center to find, uh, to find a career development path because they couldn't, you know, they couldn't get a position as a researcher or a position as a professor. It, does, it doesn't have this career development path. Yeah. It's normal if they don't find that in, and they see that in another application in the same research center, it can, that it fits, it has a perspective there. Uh, it is relative on, on, on the proposal itself. I mean, if you are going to a research center that is specialized in, uh, in the ancient history and uh, uh, there are no positions for you there or there, 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 there are no relevant of what the research and skills you are doing in the future. The same thing can apply to an application that have positions in a different way from one that there are, there are perspectives. Uh, it has not to do generally with organization, but with the project and the organization. But in a way, it is structural. Currently in Spain, with a crisis, universities are having, having no positions almost. So it is true that when we plan the career, we know it's kind of a lottery, lottery if you, you will have the opportunity to apply to a permanent position or not. So actually in this case, this particular case, it is true. This institute cannot actually hire researchers. Researchers have to be hired by departments or have to apply for further projects. The, so career, the career perspective is not necessarily uh, a position in the university. You can say that with these skills, I can work for a museum, for a research, uh, for a pharmaceutical company, for uh, in the research in, uh, in the private sector, I'm going to work for, but somehow uh, prove that 
you, you thought about your perspective, uh, not necessarily as a position in, in, in the university, of course not, or the research center or whatever. It can be whatever, uh, in the private sector, in the public sector, in the university, in, in a company, uh, what these skills are going to uh, help you to achieve these objectives. As more, more precise you are, more chances to have to be persuasive. I have just a very quick question about what can be funded as research. Can you fund um, a survey? Would that count as a technical service? Yeah, yes. Thank you very much for arriving till yeah. the end. Thank you. Thank you too.